Hello everyone, welcome to the Godan webinars. On behalf of the Global Open Data for Agriculture and uh, Nutrition, uh, with my great pleasure, I welcome you to this um, webinar series. Uh, today we have an interesting uh, topic to discuss. Uh, it's about navigating knowledge management in the digital era and uh, understanding data. Uh, for doing that, we have with us today uh, Tom Morel, who will share uh, with all of us uh, his expertise and his um, ideas on this uh, topic. Uh, I would also like to welcome all the participants and encourage them to engage to these uh, discussions. And with no further delay, I would like to introduce you to Tom um, Orell. Tom uh, founded uh, Data Ready in uh, 2018, having identified a need for less technical and more governance oriented services in the development and humanitarian sectors. Uh, his expertise lies in the links between digital and data policy, sustainable development and human rights. Tom has substantial international experience and has spent over 12 years working for UN agencies in Ethiopia and Togo, tech-oriented civil society and social purposes companies, and London-based law firms specializing in human rights law. Tom, uh, welcome to our uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Fotini, and thank you very much to all of you who've taken the time out of your busy days uh, to listen in. Um, I'm very grateful to Godan as well for inviting me to take part in this series of webinars, and I do hope that you find what we discussed today useful and interesting. Um, Fotini has done a good job of introducing me already, so I won't say uh, anything about myself, but I would just say that Data Ready exists to help um, organizations in the sustainable development and humanitarian sectors navigate the complexities of data governance um, so that we can all collectively better understand, apply and track the value that data generates for society as a whole. Uh, and the work that I do usually centers on supporting UN agencies, multinational um, corporations and companies, um, intergovernmental partnerships and other multi-stakeholder partnerships and understanding how to go govern and manage data. And this, this webinar is a bit of an experiment for me. Um, in terms of substance, it's about the foundations of data regulation and how data regulations are translated into policy um, and guidance in specific sectors. And in this, in this instance, obviously, we'll be focusing on the agricultural sector. Um, it's a reflection of my own personal views, and I think it is important to, to specify that although I do have legal background and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a non-practicing barrister here in the UK, this webinar does just represent my views and you can't construe it as, uh, as legal advice. So it's important for me to specify that at the outset. The purpose for me really is to try and and the reason I say it's an experiment is for me to try and explain what are quite complicated legal concepts and regulatory concepts as simply as possible and to explain how they translate into policy and guidance in particular sectors. So I look forward to your, your feedback later on in this webinar as to whether I've been successful or not with that. Um, the structure of the webinar and what we're going to be looking at, um, could we have the next slide please, Fotini, is First, to look at how data is defined in law. Um, uh, secondly, to look at whether data can ever be owned. Hi, Fotini, sorry, could we have the next slide, please? Um, thirdly, to see whether we, how we can differentiate uh, between data that might or might not be considered property in law. Uh, Fourthly, what personal and sensitive data are, because I find that this is an area where there's often a bit of confusion. And finally, to look at all of those, those four issues and to see how data regulations um, are translated into policy and guidance in the agricultural sector. Uh, Fotimi, could you please go back to the first? You're skipping through the slides. Sorry, could we have the, the overview slide, please? The next one. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into the first area, which is looking at data as facts. So next slide, please, uh, for the one on data and facts. Thank you. The starting point for regulation of, of data is basically the data are facts. 
right? And facts can be literally anything. So for instance, soil temperature or acidity levels in a select field at a specific time of day um, are, are facts, right? So those measures, those figures that you'll get from a sensor or from a manual, um, a manual examination will produce a figure and a number, and that's a fact. The tonnage of grain produced by a specific farm in a calendar year, for example, is also a fact. That figure that you get is just a fact. It's it's true. Um, and those facts, facts which are collected about various things, can either be non-personal or they can be personal. So data about soil temperatures, for instance, as I just uh, explained, is obviously non-personal. Whereas when taken together, my name, Tom Oral, my age, my physical address, all of these attributes when taken together can sometimes be personal data and I'll explain this a bit more uh, in a bit more of a detailed way a bit later on in this webinar. I think what's important to understand at this stage and remember is that whether personal or non-personal data are facts and whether those facts are accurate um, or not is a different question and we shouldn't confuse the two issues. At this stage we're literally just concerned with understanding what the meaning of data is because this is the basis for how it's treated in law. And it's important to grasp this at quite a fundamental level, almost a philosophical level, and, and hence the, the, the nice definition that I found in the Oxford English Dictionary for, for data, uh, linking it to philosophy, because it's, 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 really under, it's really important to grasp that um just really fundamental link between the concept of data and facts and the fact that data are facts for for most um most of the time when uh, when considered and regulated by law it's the foundation essentially on how on how law treats data and and how data governance regimes then evolve um in my work, I encounter a lot of people and organizations that want to better manage their data, but lack this foundational knowledge. And they don't, they don't really understand that from a regulatory point of view, it's important to view data as facts. And it's only once people have a real grasp of, of that issue and how it then follows through in the, in the rest of regulation that they can start to understand the mechanics of data regulation and governance and practice and apply it to their work. So can we have the next slide, please? So let's, with that in mind, let's now have a look at data ownership through the lens of regulation and, and see how the law and regulation deals with the, the issue of ownership. The question of whether data can ever be owned depends on whether uh, data can ever be considered to be property. And traditionally, facts can never be considered to be property in law. You can't own a fact. So take, for instance, the example of my name again, Tom. So my, my name, Tom, is simultaneously a data point about me, but it's also just a fact. It's a fact that my name is Tom. I can't claim to own the name Tom. So this is where the difficulties begin. Um, historically, there are two exceptions to the rule that data cannot be owned. Firstly, data is that that is copyrightable, and secondly, data that is confidential. And for data to be copyrightable, so to be considered the intellectual property of a person or a business, it has to be the product of an independent intellectual effort. So to give you an example, empirically, some data outputs from a scientific experiment may fall into this category sometimes, although even that can be contentious. So it's quite hard to exert copyright over data itself because again data is fact so it, it can be really tough to do that in some jurisdictions what you have um, are so-called database rights and database rights exist to protect databases as intellectual property but remember that because facts can't be owned even database rights where they exist can only protect the form, the structure of the database rather than the data within it. So a database rice will protect, um, for instance, the, the data architecture in the system which is designed to store the data, but not necessarily the data within it. So for instance, if an agribusiness um, in a jurisdiction where database rights are recognized started to collect data on crop yields from farmers to whom it supplied grain and if it compiled that data and stored it in a database of its own design it could claim copyright over the database and in law this would provide the agribusiness some ownership 
over the database, but it wouldn't necessarily stop competitors or other entities from also collecting and using the same data that it stores in its database. It would only provi provide protection over the structure of its database and would pr prevent others from using its database without permission. That's the first exemption around, around copyright. The second exemption to the general rule that data can't be owned as property relates to confidentiality. Data that's collected by public or private entities can sometimes be considered confidential in certain situations. So for example, um, data collected for public purpose, purposes by governments on say issues of national security or defense or diplomatic conduct and in international relations can be protected uh, under official secrets laws as, as kind of confidential property of the state. Secondly, Data collected by private companies can sometimes be considered confidential if it relates to commercial interests and if its release would be likely to damage or harm a private company's commercial competitiveness. So those are the two exceptions. But what happens to the other data? What happens to the vast majority of data which is produced, which is neither copyrightable nor confidential? Remember always this, this issue around data being facts and um, and that you can't own facts. So what happens to all of this data in terms of, of the law dealing with its ownership, as it were? And this is a, a really complex question, and it's an evolving area of law. There are no hard and fast rules yet. There's, there's a trajectory and there are general approaches which have emerged, but this is a very much a live debate. Um, even though this is contentious, the general rule and the general approach is that data are intangible and what intangible means is that they don't really have any physical presence so to give you a parallel example um, things like stocks and shares are also intangible and they're intangible property and i mean even data is distinguished from other classes of intangible property such as stocks and shares because of different attributes Digital data essentially only exists as a series of binary electronic impulses, ones and zeros, that can be moved around across IT systems, databases, etc., um, using either the internet or some other digital mode or medium of transfer. So as data are intangible and they don't have a physical presence and they can be shared very easily across different platforms and between people, what the door does excuse me, what the law does is to look at possession and control of data as essentially proxies for ownership. So, um, for the, could we have the next slide please as well? So, what the law does, keeping in mind this issue of, of data being facts, is rather than look at ownership, it looks at possession and control um, and also processing. What does this mean in practice? The starting point here again is to understand that data flows. Right. When data is used or reused, it's essentially flowing between different um, computers and other digital platforms, between software applications, between different human users and, and uh, all manner of human or digital device. And in fact, if you think about it, this is how the value of data is extracted, either through human or automatic machine analysis. Um, or as the law would say, processing of data. So by processing data, extracting those insights, doing analysis and, and running clever algorithms over the data to, to get those trends and, uh, and analyses, that's how you extract the value from data. So what the law does is it, it looks at regulating the flow of data through concepts of such as possession, control and uh, processing. As data moves around between systems and different users, it's in the possession of different people and different systems at different points in time. It's therefore controlled by different people, systems and entities at different points in time. Sometimes data can be processed and controlled by lots of different entities at the same time. So for example, when data is published and licensed as open data and made available to anyone and everyone, Lots of different people and lots of different entities can be reusing and processing that data at the same time in different ways. As data, as I've said before, as data can't be owned as property, the way in which this, this vast network of data flow is regulated is by looking at the proxies of control and processing. 
what can and can't be done with different kinds of data that's in the possession of different entities or systems at different points along the data value chain. Now, we've established that the key to extracting value from data is regulating and controlling how it flows across computer systems and changes hands between people. This flow, as I've said, is at the heart of how the law treats data regulation. What laws that regulate data aim to do is to regulate this whole process rather than the ownership of data, except with the, the, the two areas that we've identified around copyright and confidential data. Um, and what this means is that the law can confer rights and obligations on the producers of data, separate rights and obligations on the controllers of data, yet more rights and obligations on the processes of that data and also the ultimate users of that data in various different ways. And sometimes these categories can overlap. You can be a, a producer, controller, processor and user of data, or you could just be a processor of data, or you could be a controller and a processor. All of these categories are, are intertwined. And these rights and obligations around what you can and can't do with data are usually set out in, in what we call data sharing agreements or data sharing arrangements. You might have heard them as DSAs or data contracts. These are a broad category of, of a type of contract essentially which set out the terms and conditions under which data can be used by different entities at different points in time. Some jurisdictions, such as the European Union, have quite specific rules about how data sharing agreements or arrangements should be written and what they should contain. And permission to reuse data in various ways is then granted through licenses, whether open or proprietary. And the one, the one area that you're likely to come across the, the, the concept of data ownership and where you might see the word data owner in a contract, in a data sharing agreement, is in relation to the person who has permission and authority to issue a license. So usually the person or the entity that has produced the data can be called the data owner or the data originator and they can issue data licenses for other people to use their data. But the reason I didn't start with this I, the reason I didn't start this webinar with the concept of data owner is because it's really important to separate the legal concept of data ownership from what we mean in everyday language. Um, by data ownership. That's why I started with the concept that data are facts and that facts can't be owned. When we're talking about data ownership in the legal sense here, we're only talking about basically someone who has control over data at the point of its origin and ownership only exists really in the sense that they have a right to set the terms of how reuse can happen. Um, so you have to separate those out in your minds a little bit for the purposes of understanding data regulation. And it's, you know, all of this complexity, right, around data sharing agreements, around licenses, around what we mean by legal ownership that scares so many practitioners in, in so many different fields and sectors. And what I've tried to do in this section is just to explain where a lot of that confusion comes from, why it exists, um, and to, to explain why the law treats data regulation in this slightly convoluted slightly artificial way um, but hopefully that that's been been helpful um, to you in, it, in understanding the fluid nature of how data regulation operates so for this second part of the webinar there's this three main components the first part was this was explaining data as facts and looking at ownership the second is now looking at, at personal and sensitive data and then the third is looking at, at all of this in the context of agricultural data um, so in this component we're just going to for a few minutes look at personal and sensitive data because this is an area where I think there's often quite a lot of confusion and there's also quite a lot of interest generally. The issues of control and how data is controlled and processed apply to personal and sensitive data too and often these issues are actually more acute and are more pronounced in these contexts. So for example in jurisdictions where robust data protection laws exist, data sharing agreements will usually be a legal requirement um, when setting out permission on how personal and sensitive data may be used. In the European Union, under the, the general data protection regulation, you have to have a data sharing agreement in place um, if you want to share and process and use personal data um, belonging to other people. So it's a legal compliance requirement. You have to have it there. Not everywhere in the world is the same, but it's generally a good practice. Many people 
think that personal or sensitive data are fixed or concrete fields or categories of data. This is wrong. Personal data can be any data or information through which an individual, often referred to as a data subject in, in legislation, can either be directly or indirectly identified. And you'll see on the slide that the, the key question that you always have to ask yourself is how likely is it that the data will result in an individual becoming identifiable. So if you published a particular data point or a particular data set, how likely is it that you'd be able to identify someone? That's how you work out what personal data is. And I'll, I'll give you an example um, to, to explain what I mean by all of this, because it can be quite difficult. Coming back to the data point that's my name, Tom. In and of itself, as I said, the, the word Tom is not personal data. If the word Tom just appeared in a spreadsheet, in an Excel sheet, all by itself, that wouldn't be personal data. If, however, the word Tom was linked to my surname, Oral, so Tom Oral, if it was also linked to my address, to my date of birth, etc., it might start to become personal data, depending on the likelihood of it resulting in me being personally identifiable. And let me explain this concept, and I've tried to think of examples for this, and, and the one I've come up with is, for example, if we did a population register um, survey in the UK and just asked only for one data point from everyone, you just asked for people's names. So you, you surveyed literally the 72 million or so people in the United Kingdom, and you just recorded their names in a, in a big, big spreadsheet. The name Tom Oral would probably appear several times. It might appear 50 or 60 times out of a population uh, of 72 million people. I imagine that there are a few other people in this country who share the exact same name as me. Because there'd be 50 or 60 people in that data set, um, and it's a, therefore a relatively common name in, in the UK, that wouldn't necessarily be personal data about me, um, so long as there's no other identifiable information in there. If, for instance, it had that data set had on my name, but it also had my age and it also had my address, obviously, you'd then be able to identify me individually. But if it was just my name, it wouldn't be personal data. However, a data set, say, if you were to do the same exercise in Kenya, just as an example, um, because I was recently there. So if you're in Kenya and you did a, a similar exercise and you recorded all 46 million Kenyans um, names in, in one big spreadsheet, it's very likely that I would be the only Tom Oral in that, in that data set, that, because it's not a very common name in Kenya. So if I was the only Tom Oral in that data set, that's when things become problematic, because for that data set, even though there are no other data points about me, that data, um, that name there is likely to be personal data about me because you can identify me by simply kind of looking up, doing kind of auxiliary searches and finding other data points. And you, you'd be able to identify me as an individual in Kenya a lot more easily. So this concept of, of, uh, of personal data is quite complex. And what I've tried to do with that example is to highlight how in certain contexts, something that might not appear to be personal data can become personal data. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind as well is that you know the more data points that you have about a person, the more likely when taken together, um, they're likely to be considered personal data when looked at as a whole. And the example I've given on the slide as well, I think is, is quite helpful, especially for you in, in, in the agricultural sector, that you know you can have two date data points which on their own would not be personal data but when you combine them they can become personal data so a good example for instance would be a satellite image of some farmland on its own that wouldn't necessarily contain you know you wouldn't be able to identify anyone necessarily sometimes you might be able to but generally perhaps you wouldn't necessarily be able to identify anyone but if you were to combine and overlay that satellite image with a land registry entry and the coordinates of that land registry entry all of a sudden it would become very easy to be able to identify someone in that satellite image or at least the risk of being able to identify someone would increase so all of a sudden that combined data set would become personal data so 
I really wanted to just spend a few moments explaining how that operates and how you get to the decision of working out whether something is personal data or not, because this is an area where people do get confused. The other point on personal data is that it's important to remember that there are some pretty obscure data points that can be considered personal data in the right context. So, for instance, internet cookies, uh, IP addresses, objects within satellite images, or even mobile location data, even when theoretically anonymized, if they're not anonymized uh, and aggregated to a sufficiently high data point, so for instance, if, if they're only aggregated to five or 10 individuals, um, if you combine that mobile data with, with other data points, again, the risk of re-identification actually becomes quite high and quite easy. Um, so you've got to be really careful when you're talking about using these new sources of data um, about how you're, you're looking at combining them with other data sets to reduce those risks. All of this has implications for how data is regulated and controlled. And there are many de-identification and anonymization techniques that exist to minimize the risks of controlling, processing, or using personal data. But it's important to remember that even when these approaches are applied, given what I've just described about the nature of personal data, the risk of re-identification will generally always be there. I think that, that there's an emerging consensus that it's never really truly possible to, to completely anonymize um, data sets. I don't want to scare people though with all of this. I think it's important that while all of this is true, it shouldn't impede or stop innovation. But what it should do is inform how organizations and companies develop their data management strategies and plans really need to be in place for any project that involve the use of digital data. There must be a plan in place and it must be documented um, that indicates what steps have been taken to mitigate potential and foreseeable risks and what would happen in the event of a data breach. How would you go about protecting people's rights and protecting people's people's personal data. So while it shouldn't impede innovation, it's something to be aware of and to really understand the, the, the context of how personal data operates and then to take proactive steps to try and mitigate against foreseeable harms. Similarly, sensitive data, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of, of time on that, but sensitive data is, is essentially a subset of personal data. And historically, the reason that it's separate from personal data is that sensitive data relates historically to form uh, to the to categories of data which have formed the basis of discrimination against people in the past so these are especially um, uh, sensitive sets of personal data hence the word sensitive data because they're particularly sensitive and historically if you think about the the areas in which people have been discriminated against you can think of areas around um, for instance people's health so for instance their HIV status uh, can be very sensitive data if they live in countries and within communities where it's taboo to live with HIV um, people's race their political beliefs, their religion, their sexual orientation, all of these categories of data are very sensitive because they can form the basis of discrimination against people. So those categories of data have even more, uh, even higher data protection compliance requirements usually in, in good data protection laws. And they should very rarely, if ever, be shared. The justification and the, the thresholds for, for using and sharing sensitive data are very, very high. Um, for good reason. And how does the law treat possession and control of personal and sensitive data? Um, I've discussed kind of what I think at least good approaches should be, right? So you take steps to identify what those risks might be and you take steps to, to plan for what would happen if something bad were to happen. But around the world there are very different approaches and there are at least three different trends emerging, if not more, certainly three broad geopolitical trends. The first um, trend, let's say, is coming from North America and the United States. And in the United States, the, while there's no specific law protecting personal privacy, there are laws that protect certain classes of personal or sensitive data 
um, depending on the, the specific use and, and context. And it's largely because of that legal vacuum around um, strong data protection laws that it's US companies which have been able to, to create business models which generate so much profit off the back of the processing of personal data. So think of the Facebooks, the Alphabets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this model has proliferated because because of the lax approach towards the protection of personal privacy uh, in the home jurisdiction in the US. In Europe, obviously, what we've seen emerge is a very different approach to regulation. We've got the general data protection regulation, as I mentioned, and other related laws and precedents, which have essentially they fused the historically distinct concept of privacy with data protection. And as a result, this very person, individual-centric and consent-based approach to the control of personal data has emerged. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. In China, um, this is the third major global trend, um, there's very little distinction between personal and non-personal data, and the state has very intrusive powers to be able to collect and process and use uh, people's data in various different ways. And so the Chinese are now developing highly advanced um, automated systems which can, can identify people, et cetera. They're applying them in their own in their own jurisdiction um, in a way which some could be some could perceive as quite repressive and they're exporting these technologies as well to other countries and often you find in many parts of the world that you now have this tension between different kinds of technologies which have been developed uh, in, in different jurisdictions by various companies and are now trying to be used together and it doesn't always work uh, so it's quite interesting. The fourth area um, and this is something that affects my work quite a lot is that in many of the poorest parts of the world um, there are no data protection laws at all yet and so you have this uh, this big gap in the law essentially around how do you actually control and process uh, personal data and this is particularly problematic for me and for others who work in this transnational space uh, when we're work looking at sustainable development projects for instance in countries and in contexts where there are no legal provisions around how personal data should be protected what's the right approach um, you can't just you know take the concepts from one jurisdiction and, and put them into another jurisdiction um, and this raises questions around ethical data use, et cetera. I think you know, we have to be careful around how we talk about ethical data use. Ethical data use certainly does have a, a place in society, but ethical data use shouldn't replace regulation. But ethics, ethics are very important when we're talking about contexts where there is no data protection, because then you do have to start asking yourselves, you know, we generally have to start asking ourselves and myself included you know just because we can do something should we actually do it um what are the implications of this for people's privacy what are the implications of something were to go wrong um this is where these questions become very important generally speaking i would say there is there's generally a, a global swing towards the european model um that uh, that puts individuals rights at its heart um this European model is essentially built on the premise that while an individual can't own the data about them, remember what I was saying about data being facts and you can't own facts, um, what an individual can do is exert quite a lot of control over the decisions around how data about them should be used. So this means that within the GDPR and within European law, you know, the, the, the issue of consent is, is really central to that, and it must be fully informed consent. An individual has to really understand how data about them is going to be used, and they have to explicitly provide consent um, to, to the data being used in that particular way. And the EU and the GDPR has developed a whole series of rights that people have over data. They have the right, obviously, to know uh, what's being um, done with the data about them. They have the right to access data about them. They have the right to amend data that's held about them by third parties, whether private companies or, or government. They have the right to move their data around, this right of data portability, which we'll talk about in a moment. And they have even the right to be forgotten in certain situations. So historic data, which may appear here online if it's prejudicial to them in some way um, but no longer relevant they have the right to ask that that data be removed from the record um, so you have quite a lot of, of rights over your data and taken collectively all of these rights have fed into a concept in Europe um, that's termed individual data sovereignty 
right? So this principle that an individual should have data sovereignty, um, sorry, should have sovereignty over the data about them. So just like states have sovereignty over how um, assets and natural resources uh, and how they should govern themselves, um, individuals should have sovereignty to make decisions about how data about them is used and processed. So this is still an emerging area and sometimes it comes into clash and conflict with other approaches to data regulation around the world, but because of the size and power of the, the European single market um, and the way in which the GDPR operates to capture even in some instances things which are outside of jurisdiction, it has had quite a big effect, I think, on, on many countries about how they how they treat um, uh, data regulation. So I know I've been talking now for quite a long time, about 30 minutes or so. There's just one more section that I'd like us to go through, which is to look at, at how all of this comes together in the agricultural sector. Um, and that's the final section. So if you just bear with me for another four or five minutes or so um, to go through that section, and then we can open up for a discussion. Before I go into that section, I just want to very briefly take stock of where we are and to recap, because I've covered quite a lot of, of material here. So we started out with the general proposition that data are facts, and then we said that facts can't be owned in law, but in certain situations, there are ways in which data can be owned. Um, if that data is the result of, of an independent intellectual effort, sometimes it can be copyrightable. Databases which are designed and created to store data can be copyrightable if, if that right exists. Most of confidential data can sometimes be treated as property. We've, we've then seen and, and, and explored um, in a little bit of depth the types of mechanisms which are used to control, uh, sorry, to regulate the control, processing, and use of data. So we've 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 discussed issues um, uh, around data sharing agreements and licenses. And finally, now I've just taken a quick look at um, at the nature of personal and sensitive data and why they can be quite difficult concepts to, to handle. So that's that's where we've been um, so far. And for this line or final part, as I say, we're just going to look at what the implications of all of this uh, are for, for agricultural data. Thank you, Fotimi, for, for changing the slide. Um, and this is the last slide, I think, before, before the thank you slide. Um, so the focus here will be looking at the interplay between EU regulations and the EU code of conduct on agricultural data sharing by contractual agreement, a very pithy title. I just wanted to take one example to show you how regulation is translated into policy guidance um, in, in the agricultural sector. And as I said at the beginning, I hope that through this exercise in particular, you'll leave the webinar better informed um, on how regulatory issues around data ownership, control, processing, etc., play out in the real world in the agricultural sector. And so when you're looking at, at, um, at codes of conduct in future, you'll be better informed and better able to understand some of the concepts which underpin their contents. Before we look at the code itself, the European code, I just want to touch very briefly on one final piece of the regulatory puzzle at the European level. A lot of people have heard of the GDPR, but there's also an equally important regulation on the free flow of non-personal data. So the GDPR deals with personal data. And remember what I said at the beginning, the first level of disaggregation always when looking at data is, is it personal, is it non-personal? If it's personal, you have all these things you have to consider. If it's non-personal, you have a whole other set of issues. So the free flow of non-personal data is like the GDPR's brother. It sits there alongside the GDPR, but it handles how you process and how you deal with non-personal data. And the way that the EU has decided to regulate this is to try and open it up and make it as free and accessible as possible, hence the free flow of non-personal data. And the reason for this is because the European Union is trying to develop a, a single digital market, uh, sorry, digital single market. So some of you may be aware that in the European Union we have the, the single market and the single market is essentially um, a concept founded on four freedoms that between the countries of the European Union there should be free movement of capital, so money, free movement of goods, free movement of services and free movement of labour, sometimes confused with people usually for political purposes but it's actually free movement of labour. And so 
what the digital single market is seeking to do and the development of the digital single market is to add a fifth pillar to that almost so the the free movement of data across and within borders and so the free flow of non-personal data regulation has identified two barriers two major barriers to the free flow of non-personal data and it tries to set out rules and regulations around how to break those down the first barrier is data localization requirements. So in some countries and in some jurisdictions, countries require that data be kept on servers inside the jurisdiction. Now that's fine for some countries, but in the European Union, where everybody across different countries is theoretically meant to have access within the single market to, to, to the same resources, um, mostly for com competition purposes, Europeans view competition as healthy and a good thing for the economy at lowest prices, at least when I say Europeans, I mean within the context of the law. Um, uh, obviously, not everyone agrees with that, but it's it's a political view, but it's one that's reflected within our laws and policies. So by opening up um, localization requirements and freeing data, as it were, so that it can flow across different countries more easily, you're improving competition. The second is to prevent vendor lock-in. And vendor lock-in is essentially a situation where the producer, sorry, where the user or, of a product or a service cannot easily transition to a competitor's product or service. And there are several examples we can look at as individuals. So for example, think of how hard it can be sometimes to change mobile, mobile provider or to change electricity supplier or to change bank account provider, so to change banks. These things can be really difficult to do sometimes. And as the digital economy has emerged in the past 10 to 15 years, one of the major barriers and one of the major reasons why it's so hard to change these services is because of data um, flows being kept internally within organizations and companies and data not being allowed to, to flow freely. Um, so this, this regulation seeks to deal with that. How does this relate to agricultural data? The regulation itself emphasizes self-regulation for industries, and it specifically mentions the agricultural sector. So what it basically says is these are the principles that we want to apply. We want to break down data localization requirements. We want to break We want to break vendor lock-in. Um, and the way that we're going to do this is by getting sectors to, to regulate themselves. And precision farming is mentioned as a specific area within the preamble uh, where a large quantity of non-personal data is produced. Um, and and what the what the what the regulation goes on to state is that a voluntary code of conduct should be developed for each sector uh, to help self-regulate and create rules for the sector itself on how to approach and how to comply with the regulation. So in the agricultural sector, um, this is how we've ended up with the European Code of Conduct for agricultural data. And the, the Code of Conduct is a great document for understanding how the various concepts that I've discussed in this webinar come together and play out in policy guidance. Just looking at the introduction to the code, we can immediately see the links to the regulatory language that I've discussed. The code discusses data flows and talks about the data life cycle. It then goes on to refer to collection, transfer, processing, analysis, etc. So remember what I was saying about all these proxy terms for what normal people would just call ownership. But in law, it's not ownership, it's transfer, processing, collection, possession, all of these words which reflect the fact that data flows and that's recognized in law. The code then really then um, goes on to specify that generally it applies to non-personal data, but it also accepts that some data sets um, but that can potentially identify a person might contain non-personal and personal data and that in those situations where personal data exists, that will fall under the scope of the General Data Protection Regulation. The core of the document, and this is really my final point here, the core of the document sets out the five points which are set out on the slide, um, that data sharing agreements should recognize the rights of farmers to have data attributed to them. And I, you might remember earlier, I, I mentioned um, that legally you, you can call some people data owners. Usually the data producers can be called the data owners or the data originators, but that's only insofar as that they then have the right to have the fact that the data was produced by them attributed back to them. So it's almost an attrib attribution clause. The second point 
Um, the, and the second area that the code covers is processing, so the use of agricultural data. And the code is very clear that this should only happen and it can only be processed if the, the data owner, so the farmer who's produced the data, has consented to it. And again, consent has to be fully informed. That means that the farmer has to have a very clear understanding of all the different use cases in which the, his data or her data is going to be used and they have to proactively consent to all of those use cases and then they have the right to license um, their data to be used by other entities through a data sharing agreement and those licenses can be open data or they can be proprietary so you can charge people under the license to be able to use your data in particular ways Thirdly, as I've mentioned, the, the, the code acknowledges that both non-personal and personal data can exist, and where personal data does exist and relates to the agricultural sector, it has to be pseudonymized. Pseudonymized means you have to take out of it and you have to, uh, out of the data set, any characteristics which could be used to identify someone, and also that data has to be encrypted, so there's a bit of a hardware requirement there as well. Fourthly, and almost finally, data agreements should, you know, they need to set out the security and confidentiality responsibilities quite clearly. So these documents need to get quite clear and quite technical, these contracts between data producers and users in the ag sector. And finally, a really, really important point, liability must be covered within the, uh, within the agreement. This is really, really important, and this is especially important for trust. What happens when things go wrong between farmers and agribusinesses, for instance? If licensed data is inaccurate, right, so a farmer has provided inaccurate data, Who's responsible for that if an agribusiness is paid to be able to then use that data? Is it the farmer who should be sued? Is it the manufacturer of whatever sensor that farmer has been relying on to, to produce that data and that sensor might be faulty? Who's liable? So working out those questions is really important. Or conversely, what happens if the agribusiness, um, which has received a license for data use, does things with that data that the farmer didn't agree to and did the license doesn't cover, can the farmer sue the agribusiness to then reclaim any value that he or she may have lost through that? You know, it, it's important that these documents and these contracts set out exactly what will happen in these situations in as much detail as possible, because that's the only way that you can really build that trust between data producers and users in a way that's sustainable and clear. That's my last point, and I've been talking for a very long time, so thank you very much for bearing with me. I hope that this has been useful, um, and I know that we have a few minutes for, uh, for a conversation. From my side, I'm available to, to stay online for a few more minutes if that conversation goes over, um, but I, I defer that to the, the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for uh, this uh, useful uh, inside of yours. Uh, I think you really said li uh, light to some uh, complex issues in terms uh, like data ownership and uh, data um, uh, control and uh, also uh, what are the uh, issues of uh, privacy and uh, personal and non-personal data uh, and how this uh, could really uh, affect specifically the um, agricultural sector. Uh, I would like to see a little bit, um, just a moment, a question. Um, so one question here is, um, so what happens when you create derived data? that is truly one's uh, IP rights. Um, I don't have the, the, na oh, the name is, Thiago, uh, Thiago Terzi asks this, what happens when you create derived data? Uh, Tom, would you like to respond? I guess it, it depends on, on context. I mean, derived data, if you mean by derived data, so data derived from insights, from someone's data set, et cetera, it will depend, I guess, I mean, it depends on the context, I think is the first thing to say. It depends what licensing structures are in place, what agreements are in place, and whether or not those agreements have set out um, stipulations about how data can be reused. Um, it, I mean, it, it's completely context specific. If, 
if if you if you come across a data set which is licensed for general general and open reuse um there'll usually be a clause in a good open data license there'll be a clause that says that you're able to reuse that data in a way which um uh, even for commercial purposes and in that case you're perfectly fine if you're aggregating data um from lots of different producers um and you've paid for a license to get that data from those producers um, unless that license clearly says that you have a right to then reuse and aggregate that data and derive new insights from it etc i think this is what you're getting at um if that if that license has a clause that, that covers that and a farmer has explicitly consented to you doing that and that's covered in the cost that you've paid for that license then you should probably be okay um if they haven't consented to that explicitly and that's not covered by the terms of your license it will depend on the jurisdiction and the, the terms um i would emphasize though that's quite a detailed response and as i would just re-emphasize my legal disclaimer that don't take what i'm saying to you right now as legal advice uh, you can't apply this to any specific facts for the time being you'd have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis but i think that would be the approach thank you thank you tom uh, very much uh so your, um, I would like a little bit to just um, focus on that uh, uh, about data um, ownership and uh, data control. So in order to make things simple, is it better or is it more correct to address the issue more from not the, the perspective of data ownership uh, rather than the perspective of um, right to access and control of the use and reuse of data, correct? Yes, I think I think it's really important that people start to think. Uh, that pra when I say people, I mean practitioners, including myself here. This is a learning curve for me as well. That trying to keep on top of how regulations are shifting around data is very difficult it's not an easy area um and you know i even I, i'm not completely on top of it all um the but what is important i think is the practitioners and people working on whether it's policy or developing agricultural projects or working very closely with farmers or agribusinesses to start to think about data in terms of a flow and to start to think about the various junctures across the life cycle of data, um, so from collection, compilation, analysis, dissemination, et cetera, et cetera, reuse, to start to think about the, the issues of control and processing along those along that data life cycle. So there's, I guess there's three things to keep in mind, right? Always there's possession. So who has possession of data at a particular point in time? Who can legally be said to be the controller of that data? And is that data being processed by anyone at any particular point in time? And if so, how do all those rights and responsibilities interplay with each other um, between those three categories of people? I see someone with their hand up as well on the uh, list. Okay. Um, another question is, um, what are your thoughts um, about a data exchange platform? But I, um, again, so I'm, I think I think my thought data exchange platforms are great, right? And I think we need to uh, we need to for non-personal data. So speaking exclusively about non-personal data here, we need to be able to exchange and share as much information as possible. I'm talking here from a um, from a sustainable development point of view, not from a, a a private company's point of view, but from a from a public policy point of view, the more data that's available freely for people to be able to reuse and to innovate with, the better. Um, saying that, again. When you're setting up a data exchange, there are, there are things to keep in mind. The risk of identification, even if you think that the data that you're sharing through your platform on its own um, might not be personal and you think that there is no risk of, of it becoming personal data, you always have to keep in mind, if you're licensing it for reuse, you know, what would happen if someone took this data from this data exchange and combined it with also freely available satellite images? What would happen if someone took this and combined it with accessible data registry information, uh, sorry, land registry information? 
you have to keep in mind what the risks of re-identification might be. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and you have to have, you have to document that you've thought about that and to think about what you would do in the worst case scenario. The other thing to keep in mind, again, as I've just said, is to think about licensing terms. So do you have the right, you, the first question is, do you have the right to actually post that data to your data exchange? Have you got the right um, permissions and consent in place from the data producer, the data owner in this case. And likewise, similarly, what are the terms of reuse that you've set? Do you have clear terms of reuse on your data exchange for how the users of your, uh, your platform um, will be allowed to reuse that data? So those are the types of considerations I keep in mind from a data governance and policy perspective if you're setting up a data exchange. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, another question uh, is from um, Leah Sonne. She asks uh, if you can please share examples of the regulatory laws that govern open data sharing or agricultural data management in the agricultural sector. To what extent do these laws affect academic researchers, if you have any examples? I don't specific. I don't have specific examples in those areas. I am not an agricultural um, uh, practitioner in, in, in any sense. My work is quite broad and covers data governance issues generally. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, I've looked into a couple of documents. So the free flow of data regulation and the, the European Code of Conduct. Um, but beyond that, I've not looked at, at uh, more specific agriculture specific regulations or, or documents. Um, I, in terms of the open data part of that question, um, open data from a legal point of view is kind of it's the the execution under access to information laws of of a government's requirement to proactively disclose data. So what I mean by that is in many countries in the world you have access to information laws, sometimes called freedom of information laws, and one of the key tenets and one of the key principles of, of freedom of information um, is that governments have a requirement and a duty to proactively disclose data and information. So that duty of proactive disclosure, which means they shouldn't wait until someone asks them for data, but they should just put as much data out there as they can, obviously being safe to do so in non-personal data. Um, so access to information laws would be the starting point for requirements on open data. And uh, in, in countries where the open data regimes are well advanced, that's usually where you'll find from a legal point of view, uh, the, the mandate for that. But then you'll usually have an executive branch, an executive office, which is responsible for open data policy. So for making the more specific decisions around what data sets to disclose, et cetera. But from a legal point of view, it would be access to information law. In terms of um, uh, agriculture specific stuff, as I said, uh, unfortunately, that's not an area that I'm overly familiar with. The focus of this webinar was um, what I tried to convey is more the more foundational and fundamental principles which apply regardless of sector. Oh, thank you, thank you, Tom. And uh, one last question because we don't have so much time from uh, Nestor uh, Mahazosi. Uh, if uh, you could um, answer to um, what is the right or uh, responsibility of the transient infrastructure or system provider company? I'm not quite sure I understand that. The uh, if you mean an intermediary. There's a whole load of um, literature around the rights and responsibilities of, of data intermediaries, so things like telco companies, et cetera. And again, you have to think back. It's Everything is context specific. I'm really sorry that people always think with anything to do with law that they're going to get a hard, a hard and fast answer of this is the way and that's it. The reality is uh, in regulation and law, that's very rarely the case. The reality is you have to look at the context and you'd have to look again at the starting point would be what's the what's the jurisdiction, right? So what does the jurisdiction say? What are the laws of that particular country around how data should be shared, governed, controlled, etc.? The second thing then to look at would then be to map out to the regulation in the, in the particular context who's the data producer, who's the data owner, if different, who's got possession of the data at different points in time, is the intermediary, you know, ever in possession of data? Are they therefore the controller of that data? Are they only ever the processor of the data, et cetera? And you have to work out these different roles and responsibilities, keeping in mind that each entity can be more than one, um, and then work backwards from there to identify what 
what the rights and responsibilities should be. As I've said, and what I've tried to convey with this webinar is that this is an incredibly complicated area um, and it's evolved in a very peculiar way um, because of that initial foundational um, starting point of data being considered as facts in law and facts being unownable. And as I say, there are conflicting and there are emerging other schools of thought uh, within jurisprudence which are starting to, to consider data as property in a, in a very different way. But at the moment, the best approach in my view that we have is to consider control, possession and processing rather than ownership. Um, that may change in future. Uh, thank you, Tom, so much. And uh, with your uh, last phrases, I would say that you have answered uh, in a way um, Sipwe uh, Matangwa um, question about uh, how um, farmers can be protected uh, because farmers do have a lot of data, but her question um, was how uh, um, uh, can this uh, data be protected? Uh, so I think that your final uh, words uh, is uh, an answer to this, meaning that if farmers are aware of it is more of an issue of um, control and access of data and not of who owns really uh, data if farmers also are aware uh, what it is considered personal data and it's not and what it is not considered personal data uh, or uh, also uh, you highlighted the development of codes of conduct in agriculture uh, I, I guess this is a, a way of uh, farmers being more uh, protected. Uh, wouldn't you agree? And by having your closing remarks with that, uh, is this a, a way of uh, uh, somehow farmers could protect um, their data if they are Absolutely. aware of all these um, issues? The, the codes of conduct, the code of conduct that I read for the European Union, even if you're not in the European Union, it's a very accessible document. It sets out these concepts as clearly as possible. And I think it's a really good starting point for people anywhere um, who are looking to try and understand how to protect farmers' rights. Um, the, the, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's important that as many people as possible try and understand and gain this foundational knowledge of how data is regulated. Um, I think that's the starting point. We all have an opportunity to educate ourselves and to, to kind of get our heads around how, um, how data is treated in, in regulatory environments. And I've, I've tried to do that to some degree. Beyond that, I think that there's very much a role for non-governmental organizations, for governments to create templates and for others, multilaterals as well, and even the agribusinesses themselves to, to help develop templates of data sharing agreements and data licenses, which are responsible, ethical and equitable towards the rights of farmers to ensure that farmers are data, whether it's personal data is being protected properly or not, their non-personal data is being used in ways which is appropriate and that they're being compensated for that data uh, through the licensing regime. So, yes, essentially that, you know, you, you have to think of, of these issues of control and processing and possession and ownership as the, the ways in which you can help to empower farmers. What are the rights and responsibilities that you'd attach to each uh, and how can you maximize their rights using these concepts? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tom. Uh, again, um, I think that uh, uh, this webinar was very useful and uh, very insightful. Um, you set up and uh, set light to these uh, issues that, as you mentioned, all these issues are complex uh, in general and you can also say that it's more complex in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, thank you again, uh, and um, I would like to thank also all the participants and to uh, mention that uh, this webinar uh, will be uh, circulated uh, within the next days uh, with uh, Tom's uh, presentation as well. And uh, should you have any more questions, you can uh, send them to the data rights and responsible data working group. So I could forward them to uh, Tom Orell and uh, he 
would uh, answer them and share them uh, again. Um, once again, thank you all for your uh, participation and uh, stay tuned for our next uh, webinar. Thank you all. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.